There is perhaps no better marriage between that of Star Wars and the interactive medium. The vast galaxy filled with strange creatures and interesting worlds, the fairy tale heroes and villains, the spaceships and technology, and the fact that they emerge to a market much at the same time. Star Wars has always been the perfect fit for kids to dive into the role of Luke Skywalker and the crew and take on the Galactic Empire themselves. For many years, these adventures would be solely based on singular key moments from the film, rather than taking players on a journey through the entire Star Wars saga. That is, until Super Star Wars. Super Star Wars, the trilogy of side-scrolling action games on Super NES, brought the entire saga to consoles for the very first time, allowing not only your favorite Star Wars moments to be experienced, but also an expanded take on the franchise, with a rich roster of characters and locations not always seen in the films, not to mention the absolutely fantastic rendition of John Williams' classic score and the clever use of Mode 7 effects to simulate 3D gaming. So, journey with us into that galaxy far, far away, as we take a look at how Super Star Wars came to be, the legacy it would leave behind, and of course the comparisons between the many official and unofficial ports throughout the years. Now this is DF Retro. As video games continued its rise to seemingly never-ending popularity around the world, Star Wars as a franchise found itself in a slightly weird place throughout the decade. With the closure of the original saga, at least as we knew it at the time, in 1983's Return of the Jedi, rumors had begun to swirl concerning a new trilogy of films. George Lucas, however, seemingly adamant that the franchise could not continue under the current constraints of technology and production, as the three films had left him frustrated and exhausted with the constant need for special effects innovation. Lucas had also entered a rather contentious divorce proceeding at this time from his wife, Marcia Lucas, the original editor of Star Wars, leading to many assuming that the official franchise was being put on ice indefinitely. During this time, however, the video games of Star Wars were rather simplistic in concept, though quite notable in technology and popularity. The original arcade game of Star Wars from Atari, released in 1983, was revolutionary in its use of vector graphics to recreate the Death Star assault during the Battle of Yavin, as well as its use of digitized speech and sound effects pulled directly from the film. Use the Force, Luke. The game works in three segments. First, taking on TIE Fighters, before taking on the surface cannons, leading into the trenches, where you place some blast torpedoes down the exhaust port. The game was a monumental success and ported to nearly every microcomputer and console at the time, sometimes with shockingly good results considering the primitive hardware available, and would also serve as the basis for the follow-up The Empire Strikes Back arcade game as a conversion kit on the original cabinet. On the home console front at the time, players could enjoy games such as Star Wars, Death Star Battle, and Star Wars Jedi Arena, as well as taking on AT-ATs in The Empire Strikes Back. While the majority of these games are pretty good quality and decent fun, none of them really allowed for much exploration of the Star Wars saga outside of the key scenes they represented, and are singular screen experiences, basically. Now, 1984's Return of the Jedi, also from Atari, takes on more from the titular film in the form of isometric action with the speeder bike chase and the Death Star run both being represented here. A cancelled Atari 2600 game would have also seen the battle from the Ewok's point of view in Ewok Adventure, bringing us closer to the opportunity to experience more of the entire saga at one time in a video game form. But after this, things would go quiet for quite some time. With the absence of actual film projects from Lucasfilm on the horizon, the universe of Star Wars began to grow from other places. 
the concept of expanding upon this universe was not completely alien to Star Wars, as 1978's Splinter of the Mind's Eye, Adventures of Luke Skywalker, and the popular Marvel comic book series had shown the sheer flexibility of the franchise, allowed with its vast worlds and character designs. Novels such as Han Solo Adventures and Adventures of Lando Calrissian also tell the backstories of the popular characters further explored, leading to the creation of the Expanded Universe, a term that would come to encapsulate all media that deviated from the official film canon. Star Wars seemed to be living on through the interpretation of talented writers and artists going into the mid-80s, until suddenly it all seemed to stop. As Lucas focused his efforts on other franchises such as Indiana Jones while developing television series, Star Wars entered a dark time where seemingly no new media would be officially produced for the time being, and the expanded universe came to a slight halt. Lucasfilm Games, George Lucas's own video game company though, had already been established in 1982, but they were not assigned to work on Star Wars licensed video games due to prior existing deals with other developers, and primarily focused their efforts on the adventure game genre on PC once they got started. For fans in the West, it would seem that Star Wars had truly ended by 1987 as no new game or film was seemingly in production. However, things were very different over in Japan. As Star Wars entered a phase of dormancy in North America, Japanese developer Namco had acquired a license via CBS Fox to create video games based on the popular film due to the incredible sales of the Laserdisc releases in Japan of that year. But unlike most other efforts prior, Namco had set on to create a game that would encapsulate the entire first film in video game form. Headed by Sawano Kazunori, Okamoto Shinichiro, and Kishimoto Yoshihiro, veteran Namco staff members who had experience with science fiction video games with Okamoto having designed Star Luster, while Kishimoto had been instrumental in adapting the pre-existing franchise of Pac-Man into an action-adventure in Pac-Land leading Namco to feel comfortable that the team could make Star Wars work as a video game. The result? Journeying across the world of Tatooine, you take on the role as Luke Skywalker as he makes his way towards the Sandcrawler to save R2-D2, facing off Jawa as another wildlife, before facing Darth Vader in a climatic battle that sees him transforming into <laughs> Before taking off on a journey that sees you visiting other popular locales never seen in any of the movies, such as Isukaron, Tina, and the Mines of Kessel. Each planet holds a prisoner for Luke to save and force powers to unlock by leveling up by collecting the force crystals. So yes, as we briefly touched on, the game's most lasting legacy is probably that of Darth Vader's shape-shifting skills, though the game holds a lot more interesting data beyond this curiosity. According to interviews done in the Fantastic Untold Stories of Japanese Video Game Developers Volume 2, the scope of Star Wars was deemed somewhat impossible to achieve on the Famicom hardware at the time, and it wasn't deemed necessary to adhere so strictly to the source material since the concept of the licensed video game wasn't popular in Japan at the time, especially for foreign licenses. For inspiration then, the team looked towards Nintendo's major competitor, Sega, and modeled the game quite closely to that of Alex Kidd in Miracle World. Indeed, if you look closely here, the overall game layout, the underwater sections, even Sasori Veda himself, seems to all come with heavy inspiration from Alex Kidd. But the game itself is unfortunately not very good, due mostly to the incredibly unforgiving difficulty of one-hit deaths, get used to hearing that, limited continues, get used to hearing that too, and floaty controls. Star Wars by Namco is an interesting look at the early challenges of appropriating the film to console hardware, as well as how wildly different these interpretations of the source material could be, and would never see released outside Japan due to licensing restrictions. Perhaps most important to note, at least according to Mark Duddleson from My Life in Gaming who keeps faxing me this trivia, is the fact that the Star Wars lettering on the title screen is not transparent just as in the original films, whereas most of the other games you're going to see will go to make use of transparent letters. Fascinating. 
the game would have some impact on future Star Wars video games as well, regardless of its lower quality. In between each stage, there's a cockpit space section taking down TIE Fighters. The fourth power-ups allow Luke to make use of levitation and other types of assistance, and the last part of the game is an overhead trench run. All of these elements would be seen again in the next chapter of the Star Wars video game saga. But it would take almost four years until we saw that chapter finally unfold. In 1991, JVC, or JVC Musical Industries to be precise, took over the license for home console games based on Star Wars and teamed up with LucasArts themselves to ensure that their upcoming game would be a much more authentic representation of the film, marking the very first time that LucasArts had any direct involvement with a Star Wars video game. LucasArts designed, among others, Kalani Streicher, Harrison Fong, that is Fong and not Ford, Arnard Cabrera, and John Knowles to design the video game, all of whom would go on to work on the Super Star Wars series. LucasArts themselves lacked an internal team to develop on the NES hardware, however, so programming duties were handed over to Australian CZ4 Legends Beam Software, a developer who had the reputation of being able to bring out some incredible achievements from limited hardware, and had become a popular go-to developer for American publishers seeking fast, dependable development. In this iteration of Star Wars, you take on many of the key scenes from the original trilogy film. Through the sands of Tatooine, you control the land speeder in overhead sections, you explore caves to seek out Obi-Wan and power-ups, you find R2-D2 in the sand crawler, and you finally locate Han Solo and the Millennium Falcon on Mos Eisley. From there, the game takes you to the familiar location of the Death Star, where you find Princess Leia, take on the shield core generator, and the Dianoga in the trash compactor. Finally, you set off for the Death Star in your X-Wing and take on the Death Star itself. So as you can see, the game is perhaps the most accurate representation thus far, allowing most of the key scenes from the film to be interactive and experienced, though of course at a highly abridged fashion. The game employs an impressive amount of varied gameplay as well, from the side-scrolling action stages here, to the overhead land speeder sections, the cockpit fights, and the Death Star run, making for a very cinematic feel for an NES game as well as some quite spectacular graphics on these character portraits and stage transitions. The game also finally introduces the concept of interchangeable characters, allowing both Leia and Han Solo to get their time in the spotlight proper for the very first time and with their own unique abilities. Chewbacca, however, is nowhere to be seen outside of this little mention in the text. The soundtrack is also an absolute banger, with Marshall Parker fully arranging the John Williams score into some funky NES appropriate tunage. Just take a listen to this. Now that's my jam. Interestingly, there are a number of similarities from the Namco game to this, leading us to think that some of these aspects are instructions from LucasArts themselves to be in the games. For one, the game starts with Luke with his lightsaber, though in the JVC game you do have to locate the lightsaber with Obi-Wan first in the caves. You explore the sandcrawler to find R2-D2. Additionally, the cockpit sections appear in similar places in the games and are done fairly similarly as well, while the over Death Star trench run is nearly identically laid out between the two games. But what brings down the experience of Star Wars and JVC, much like the Namco game, is to continue to reliance on the absolutely suffocating difficulty as well as the imprecise controls. The jumping in the game can best be described as floaty and require a lot of momentum and luck to be pulled off proper. Additionally, the unlockable characters are made incredibly fragile, as they possess skills that might be of huge advantage later in the game, from Leia's peach-like jumping abilities to Han Solo's grossly overpowered blaster but the characters only have one life each with a very limited number of resurrections from Obi-Wan here. The extra lives in the game only apply to Luke. 
Most of the enemies in the game can drain your life bar by half or even more in one hit, and the level design leaves a lot to be desired as later in the game you'll find yourself tricked into spike pits, into ceilings, on the floor, in the corner, wherever, which really puts a stop to the fun. The game also received numerous ports, with one making huge changes to the beginning sections. On Game Boy, the game was published by none other than Capcom, and is essentially the same game, though zoomed in, similar to the Mega Man Game Boy games. Two years later, however, <sighs> Teartex would port the game to the Master System and Game Gear. For the Master System version, the game follows the same formula as the NES original, allowing for this rare direct comparison between the platform as not too many games were shared between them. But outside of a somewhat more garish color palette, the Teartex version takes a big hit in the gameplay department by having even less responsive controls and way worse music. The Game Gear version is the most interesting, as it takes the graphics from the game and reappropriates them into a brand new beginning stage. Here, you begin the game as Leia, placing the Death Star plans into the R2-D2 unit, and then take on the role of Luke on Tatooine. After this point, however, the game does follow the NES Masters of Original pretty closely, and is just as unenjoyable here. Still, Star Wars and JVC is a technical showpiece and was incredibly successful in sales. So much so that alongside the newly published Heir to the Empire novel by Timothy Zahn, it was responsible for reigniting the interest of the Star Wars franchise internally at Lucasfilms, as the popularity in the series was still well alive not only in those who had grown up with Star Wars in the late 70s, but now also with kids who were discovering it for the first time via home video and via video games. A year later, Empire Strikes Back would land on the NES and Game Boy from the same team at LucasArts, though with a brand new developer at helm, Sculptured Software. This game, unlike the previous, follows Luke exclusively on his journey from Hoth to Dagobah and then up to the Cloud City in Bespin in his quest to become a proper Jedi Knight, and the Jedi Knight powers are very much in focus in this game. Again, taking a nod from the Namco game, Empire Strikes Back has you powering up Luke with various new force powers, giving him the extra strength, levitation, and other skills that are essential to navigating the large, sprawling levels of the game. To begin with, Luke mounts a Tauntaun across Hoth in search of the probe droid before jumping into the T-47 airspeeder in an homage to the Atari 2600 game, taking down as many AT-ATs, all with the little map there and everything. From there, the swamps of Dagobah will have various disgusting insect creatures that made capture incredibly difficult for an arachnophobe such as myself before rescuing Han and Leia at Cloud City and then taking on Darth Vader himself. And yet again, the sheer brutality that is the difficulty here really makes Empire Strikes Back incredibly hard to enjoy. Sculpture Software's gameplay sees Luke taking on incredibly difficult jumps with really imprecise jumping, often requiring you to duck for several seconds to power up like a Super Mario 2 style jump, only to crash into the ceiling or any other object and ruining your momentum. It's also one of those games that will feature art design that makes it really hard to discern what is background, what is foreground, where can you land, where can you stand? Especially here in the Dagobah section, which sees you jumping into trees and wilderness with little to no clue where you can go. And even worse, plenty of blind jumps. And damn, the hit detection is all kinds of broken, good lord! Now while the JVC game followed the first movie pretty closely, Empire Strikes Back takes some rather strange liberties with the story here. After defeating Boba Fett, for example, Luke actually saves Han Solo, who tells him to go get Leia. And at the very end, Darth Vader is defeated, whereas in the film, Luke was pretty handedly defeated. So Empire Strikes Back. It's a much lesser game than the Beam Software effort, though it does have some impressive digitized speech throughout, some sparse but pretty accurate music cues, at times great sprite work, and this awesome cutscene before facing off with Vader. So while Empire Strikes Back is a less enjoyable and overall less interesting game, the teaming of LucasArts and Sculptor Software begins here, and so begins the saga of a new trilogy on a brand new super platform. With the incredible success of Timothy Zahn's breakout Star Wars novel, Heir to the Empire, continuing the saga where it had left off in 1983, the time seemed ripe to launch the Star Wars brand back into the stratosphere with the renewed interest in merchandising and even potential film scripts already in the works. 
To set the stage for this relaunch, video games would become one of the essential parts of Star Wars output over the next decade. And for the world's largest video game provider, Nintendo, the super 16-bit era had just begun. And thus, we arrive at Super Star Wars. Super Star Wars was developed by Sculptured Software, fresh off the heels for their work on the NES game The Empire Strikes Back, with LucasArts helming all the designs and overall game planning. Headed by Kalani Stryker, a producer who had already had his hands in both previous Star Wars titles for the console market, he envisioned a brand new game taking the best elements of the prior two titles while launching a brand new trilogy of games, each fully encompassing the film it is based on, and releasing each consecutive year, much like a film serial. Whereas the NES games would follow key set pieces of the film, with Super Star Wars the idea was to basically expand upon nearly every aspect of the film, showing Luke's traversal through Tatooine, exploring a much more massive sand crawler, not only inside, but also outside, even escaping Moss Eisley, rescuing the princess, and taking on the Death Star in near fully simulated 3D. The design for the game was a true technical tour de force, with all the spectacle and explosiveness of the original movie trilogy. The game's basic design then is a 2D side-scrolling action game, reminiscent of titles such as Castlevania and Turrican, featuring large enemies with slightly predictable patterns and massive weaponry that can be upgraded via power-ups. The player can also activate the high jump, similarly to the roll jump in Contra, as well as utilizing this awful-looking slide clearly inspired by the likes of Mega Man, I'd imagine. It's clear from just an immediate playthrough that the team looked closely at the most popular arcade and console games of this era and took bits and pieces from them. Throughout the course of the game, Luke acquires the lightsaber from Obi-Wan, and from here, you can freely wield the Jedi's weapon with some very satisfying sound and visual design. The lightsabers that appear across the stages, however, the health swords as they're called, increases your life bar instead. But you can also pick up things like thermal detonators for an all-screen clear, along with a big boom. When reaching Moss Eisley, two more characters become available, Han Solo and Chewbacca, whose absence was sorely missed in the previous games. Han Solo is a much faster character with a unique roll maneuver, while Chewie is slower, though takes less damage due to his size. From here, the games become an all-out assault as the trio takes on the Death Star and the Empire all by themselves. In many ways, Super Star Wars is a perfect technical showpiece for the Super NES system, and beautifully merges many different styles of play into a neat, compact package. The side-scrolling stages are beautifully detailed with deep background art and incredible sprite work, much of which was designed and detailed directly from movie props and models used for the actual films, as LucasArts had complete access to the archives for development of the game. Take a look at the boss in the Moss Eisley Cantina, for instance, the Kalhar. Most fans would recognize this character from the chessboard played by Chewie and C-3PO during A New Hope, but in this game he is made into a fully articulated boss character with an extraordinary attention to detail. Other bosses, such as the Mutant Womp Rat and the Jawenko, are also based on sketch designs within Lucasfilm, and would make their way to the expanded universe after their appearances in this game. The scale and size is massively impressive for a console title of this era. Take a look at the Sandcrawler. With some clever background layer usage and level design, the upward journey to the top of this structure feels absolutely daunting, giving off a huge sense of scale and size that really hadn't been seen in the previous games. The character sprites, such as Luke, Han, Stormtroopers, and all of the vehicles all look surprisingly good and are easily recognizable even in their pixelated form. Super Star Wars might be one of the finest examples of sprite art on the system, at least in its infancy. It's really impressive stuff. The music, then, is also an aspect that is so essential and recognizable to this franchise. It's been overhauled and is rather impressive for the Super NES. Composer Paul Webb took on the task of orchestrating the soundtrack specifically for the SPC-700 chip to be as close to John Williams' originals as possible.
the SNES really excels at slower orchestrated music as heard in titles such as ActRaiser before it, and in Super Star Wars it could be difficult for players of that time to hear the difference between the movie originals and the games of today. It really is that good. Now of course, that sounds silly in retrospect, it's certainly easier to hear the flawed aspects of the music now, as well as the slow sample rate and extensive use of reverb, but really, for the time, this was a remarkable showpiece that really demonstrated what the Super NES can bring to the table. The laser blasts sound just right, while the lightsaber whooshes through the air in a satisfying fashion. In addition, the speech samples are crisp and clear, making it all the more cinematic to play. Perhaps most impressive at the time, though, was the clever use of Mode 7. Throughout the game and for its climactic battle of Yavin, players jump into a land speeder or the X-Wing and navigate these open-ended maps. The Death Star run is perhaps even more impressive, given a proper sense of scale to the surface, taking down the turrets, while the trench run makes use of a cockpit view. It's clear that the team looked at the arcade game here and had to make sure to bring the experience to the next level, and I kind of feel they did, at least for the time. While Super Star Wars marked the beginning of a new era and a new trilogy, it still retains a lot of ideas that we saw in the NES games just two years prior. The concept of interchangeable characters with their own abilities, the general structure of the game while following the films, the locations and events unfold similarly with Luke unlocking the lightsaber in the caves, as well as having the option to use a blaster, it's all here. But of course, the big thing that it retains from the NES game is the difficulty. Ah yes, the never-ending onslaught of the Empire's assault is here in full 16-bit glory proving to be one of the most brutal experiences yet on the console. Much like the previous games, Super Star Wars limits the amount of lives and continues quite severely. The amount of pits and spikes is at an all-time high and will absolutely knock you out and send you over 12 parsecs back with an unforgiving checkpoint system. Oh, and when you die, no more power-ups for you. We're doing this old school, so if you die, you start from scratch with the weakest blaster and the smallest health bar. Enemies will often come from any angle at any time, respawning over and over again, taking out half your life bar in the process, while the bosses can be something truly fierce. Plus, look at stuff like this, the auto-scrolling jump section, it's just insanity. Now, beyond the spawn rate, the jumping itself has a slight delay due to this extra frame where your character's knees sort of bend before launching vertically. And on top of that, the collision detection is also sometimes a little wonky. But despite the difficulty, Super Star Wars fits into that narrow little space of gaming alongside titles such as Pitfall the Mayan Adventure, Earthworm Jim, and Bubsy, where with some practice and mastery of the Jedi arts, you begin to feel the flow of the game and enter into this zen-like state. You get better over time, and it, it's just satisfying enough to keep you coming back. Unfortunately, one of the game's major downfalls ties into its technical performance. Super Star Wars is still among the early wave of software for Super NES, and it, like numerous other releases such as Ghouls and Ghosts and Gradius 3, suffer from significant slowdown throughout the game. The frame rate regularly dips below the target of 60 frames per second, reducing much of the fluidity in the process. It's especially noticeable during these 3D stages, which tend to run below 20 frames per second much of the time. But as we'll see in the upcoming games, I think they're doing some tricks here that aren't typical for Mode 7 on Super NES, so that might explain why the performance is what it is. So while it does look fantastic, it never really felt as polished as you might have wanted due to the low frame rate. So yeah, Super Star Wars, it's not the perfect game, but it stands as one of the better visual showcases on Super NES during its earliest years. The authentic music, the lifelike graphics, the non-stop action, incredibly detailed cutscenes, eye-popping Mode 7, 3D stages, and more, all make Super Star Wars as much of a technical marvel to witness on home consoles as the movies were in theaters back in 1977. The whole experience is here on full display. Well, except for the trash compactor scene, I suppose, though, according to some magazines, this was perhaps meant to be included. It was clear that this would be the start of something big then, and with an all-but-certain sequel release, things could only get better from here. 
But Super Star Wars wasn't always going to be exclusive to Super NES. In fact, numerous other attempts were made shortly after its release to port the game to other systems. And in modern times, official ports have even been made. Firstly, there's the Sega Genesis conversion that was seemingly being helmed by Sega Technical Institute, the same studio that worked on titles such as Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Kid Chameleon, and Comic Zone, among many others. This version was mentioned in numerous magazines, and there's even hints of a Sega CD version that was in the works, but ultimately it never came to pass. A couple years back, however, the Hidden Palace website unleashed a prototype ROM of the game dating back to January 93 not too long after the release of the Super NES original. Now, it's rather unfinished in this form, with this basic menu allowing you to select from a range of incomplete stages, but some of these stages are actually playable and almost complete. The first thing you'll notice when loading it up is that the resolution has been increased to 320 pixels, thinning out whatever artwork was carried over from Super NES, but there's lots of touch-ups and changes beyond this. We'll talk more about the comparisons momentarily, but in terms of gameplay, Luke actually starts off with his lightsaber, which is now assigned to its own attack button, while the blaster is instead mapped to the B button, changing the flow of the action slightly. The music is also completely original and kind of bizarre. It's important to remember that this is just a prototype and doesn't represent the capability of Sega's 16-bit machine, but it does give us a peek at the conversion process. Back in this era, games designed around the strengths of one machine typically didn't translate well to another. Case in point, the artwork in Super Star Wars was designed around the color palette and resolution of Super NES, and yeah, it does not translate well to the Genesis. Now, that's not to say it isn't possible. The Great Circus Mystery from Capcom is an excellent conversion from the Super NES original to Sega's 16-bit machine. It shows that even with the softer color palette of the Super NES and the style of visuals that were common on that platform, you can still do a great version on Sega's console. But in this case, it seems like the team was struggling to find the right combination of colors. The sandy background and soft blue hues of the sky appear somewhat garish on Genesis in comparison. On the flip side, the Genesis prototype does at least have additional parallax scrolling in its background, adding depth to the select sequences. These are not additional layers, it's a scanline trick where they're simply updating the single background at different rates as it moves down the screen. Curiously, the Genesis maps are broken up into chunks, unlike the original game. The first boss, for instance, has his own selectable arena. Not that it's actually playable in this prototype state. The sand speeder section also demonstrates that there was some experimentation happening on the Genesis side. It would seem that the developers leveraged the line scrolling techniques common on the system to simulate a 3D playfield, which I'm not sure would have worked all that well, and we've seen better examples on the stock hardware. That said, this is one area where releasing Star Wars on Sega CD would have helped as its scaling and rotation features can more than match what the Super NES game offers, as evidenced in other titles released on the platform. The beginning of the Sandcrawler section really highlights the nature of the squished artwork. This is kind of the inverse of what we've seen with games converted from Genesis to Super NES. Look at something like Earthworm Jim. Jim's sprite appears stretched and squat on Super NES, but he looks correct on Genesis. This is down to the developers building the game's art around the 320 by 224 pixel mode, which Super NES doesn't support. With Star Wars though, they could have used the 256 pixel mode on Genesis, but clearly went for a slightly wider field of view by utilizing the extra pixels. Most of the game exhibits these same characteristics, fewer colors in Genesis, and often simplified tile work. It's clear that the system is capable of a lot more, had it been completed. Perhaps the performance issues which plague the Super NES game could have been solved as well. Either way, it's very cool that such a prototype even exists in the first place. But there's another version that is perhaps even more interesting, the DOS conversion for PCs created by Brainbug. The simple summary for this story is that one of the guys working for Brainbug at the time, Sam Nova, created a Mode 7 like demo on the PC. They did sort of a mock up, showed it to their German publisher Softgold, and this resulted in contact between them and LucasArts. It was then decided that they would convert Super Star Wars to the PC. 
The team received the original code and assets from LucasArts for the Super NES game, and after studying it, ultimately determined that redoing the visuals with guidance from the original game kind of made the most sense. So they recreated the entire game using a broader color palette and the capabilities of their fast PC code written in assembly language. The result is a remarkably impressive conversion that unfortunately was cancelled just prior to release due to LucasArts shifting its priorities under new management. So how does it fare against the Super NES then? Firstly note that this is captured from a vintage PC running in real DOS mode, and honestly, it's rather impressive. By and large, it looks and runs smoother than the original Super NES game. It does not run in letterbox format, however, but with an increased field of view on the left and right side of the screen. Players can also adjust the refresh rate between 50 up to 60 Hz and anything in between depending on what their monitor supports. All of the game's sprites, background artwork, and cutscenes were recreated with new detail and an increased color depth. So it runs better than Super NES and looks better too. This may seem trivial on the surface, but you need to consider that the PC during this era was not known for smooth scrolling action games. It was quite the opposite, really. Most platform games designed for 386 and 486 machines ran at very low frame rates, at least until the likes of, say, Jazz Jackrabbit. A lot of the more popular platformers during the early 90s on PCs ran at frame rates well under 30 frames per second, and this is due in part to the way the PC handles graphics. It doesn't have tile and sprite acceleration registers like consoles of this period. This of course means you can do more with the graphics on screen, but moving those pixels around at 60 frames per second was not a trivial task. Brainbug did a tremendous job then, and the game now runs perfectly smooth throughout, solving all of the performance issues present in the original. The 3D sequences in particular are rather impressive. The Mode 7-like sequences now run at a smoother frame rate, and look nicer overall I feel. Plus, the horizon line is shifted slightly, leading to a better looking camera angle. That said, the color math capabilities of the Super NES are used to give the horizon a nice fall off that's missing on PC. Now, apparently, the Death Star trench run has been greatly enhanced on PC, but honestly, I struggled to reach it for this video. This is due in part to the changes made to the core game design, often for the better, but sometimes leading to more challenge. Firstly, the balance has been shifted. Take the sand crawler. On Super NES, the top of the crawler is packed with these turrets slowly chipping away at your health. On PC, there's fewer turrets, leading to a smoother and easier experience here. But things aren't always easier. The mid-boss inside the crawler, for instance, can be cheesed on Super NES. You just stand here and fire away until he's dead. On PC, this is a lot less effective now, and the game demands more from the player. The main boss for the stage sees a similar change. Again, on Super NES, you can basically stand here, soak up damage, and you'll eventually win. It's very easy. On PC, however, you're easily knocked off into the lava, which drains your life rapidly. You need to devise a new strategy to take him out. It's much more difficult. But it is interesting. While these sequences are more challenging, it does feel like the overall game is just more polished to play. Now beyond the visual differences, the DOS version also features changes to the audio. The biggest change being that the soundtrack is now MIDI. I think it sounds great on Super NES, but I was curious to compare. So here's that original Super NES version. This is the PC version using a Roland Sound Canvas SC55 with the game configured to the Roland GS set. And just for good measure, this is how it sounds using the FM synth playback option played through a Sound Blaster AW64.
But of course, while these conversions were never officially released, Super Star Wars did make an appearance much later on more modern platforms, specifically on PlayStation 4 and PS Vita. Code Mystics brought the game to these new platforms alongside other Star Wars titles, and the resulting product is far more impressive than you might expect. It would seem that the developer altered the game in numerous ways, and you might even pray that they would alter it further. You'll see straight away with the new startup logos and the new options menu. And this is the big one. You can cycle through various filters, screen sizes, wallpapers, and the like, but most importantly, if you like, you can disable slowdown. And yes, this setting is exactly what you would hope for and expect. It essentially solves the technical issues plaguing the original Super NES release, running the game now at a very stable 60 frames per second. The Mode 7 sequences, though, are still capped at 20, but those run more consistently as well. In that sense, it's pretty much the best way to play the original game now, which is a turn of events I didn't entirely expect. That said, it isn't flawless. The scanline filter blurs the image, but uses overly thin lines, which looks somewhat inaccurate, and the bilinear smoothing option is somewhat hideous. The sharp output option is the best of the bunch, but scaling is not perfect, leading to slight shimmer during scrolling. Still, overall, it's a solid effort. Aside from the technical improvements, this is fundamentally the same game as the original. It's still challenging, and it has many of the same rough edges. As the first of the 16-bit trilogy, then, Super Star Wars made a fine impression. Its variation in gameplay, beautiful presentation, and authentic feel make it a landmark release in the history of Star Wars games. But this was just the beginning of the rebirth. As Star Wars topped the sales charts and the EU novels and comic books quickly expanded the universe, LucasArts' own take on Star Wars continued to grow as well, and it incorporated itself within the expanded canon. For instance, the acclaimed and legendary X-Wing on the PC not only saw LucasArts craft their very own Star Wars game from scratch using their dogfight simulation experience from their finest hour, but also the first brand new Star Wars story written by LucasArts itself. 1993's Rebel Assault would also push CD-ROM technology further, allowing a level of control typically unseen in video-driven experiences, while experimenting with creating new cinematic scenes within the universe of Star Wars. It was a unique experience for the time. The franchise, which had seen dormancy only a few years prior, was now quickly rising to galactic dominance yet again this time armed with one of the most astute developers in the industry. The future once again shined bright in Star Wars, but the darkest chapter in the saga was approaching the Super NES in more ways than one. A year after the monumental release of Super Star Wars, the much-anticipated Super Empire Strikes Back arrived in our galaxy in November of 93. Being based on Irvin Keschner's fantastic middle part of the original saga, Empire lays the foundation for a much darker, brooding experience, one which LucasArts could take great liberty with introducing new elements, enemies, and dangers. Sculptured Software would once again return for the sequel, Fittingly, as the very first game the two companies had worked on together was, in fact, Empire Strikes Back on the NES. Super Empire Strikes Back then follows the plot of the film, more or less accurately, with the first sections of the game taking place on Hoth. Before Luke sets off to Dagobah to start his Jedi training, and Han sets off to Cloud City on Bespin to seek out his friend Lando. The set pieces are familiar, and the same style of cutscenes help players tag along the journey seamlessly. Numerous additions and changes were made for Super Empire from the previous year's game. For one, the individual attributes and skills between the characters have been expanded greatly, at least in theory. Luke now makes use of his force powers, for instance, allowing him several skills such as levitation, invincibility, healing, and even mind control. He also starts the game with his trusty lightsaber, though the blaster remains optional and upgradable as well. 
Han Solo has greatly increased firepower to his regular blaster, as well as grenades, which can be picked up and thrown. Chewie, well, now he flips like the rest of the team for some awkward imagery and has this Zangief-style spinning lariato, but otherwise he's the same old lovable goof from the first game. The level designs are also increased in size. For the most part, Super Star Wars was rather linear outside of a few sections, but Super Empire creates more sprawling, maze-like level designs. At times it has you looking for a specific character at the end of the stage, and other times it feels like you're just running around searching for an exit. It can be a little bit confusing. Some stages, such as the Hoth base, also have several different paths to take, rather than just left to right, which does add some variety, I must admit. And some areas even include these Battletoads-style shooter segments. The game also increases its focus on boss battles, often introducing shorter stages with larger boss fights, which at times can be screen-filling monstrosities. A big key difference from Super Star Wars, though, is the removal of selectable characters. Here, each stage has a designated character instead, jumping in between the story of Han's Cloud City affairs and Luke's training, as well as Chewie's escape. Of course, the whole journey culminates with a face-off with Darth Vader himself in the air shafts of Cloud City. The Mode 7 flight stages then make their return to this game as well, though clearly there is some ancient sorcery at work here. Take a look at the Hoth stage, for instance. First of all, the graphics and scope of these stages are impressive, with pseudo-scaling enemies across the map, full 360-degree simulated 3D graphics, and fantastic audio design. But what's this? There's elevation now? So, I'm not entirely sure how this was achieved, but I can confirm that this is indeed a Mode 7 plane being used. What's fascinating is that, as you can see, there is some trickery being used to simulate height, allowing you to fly up and down hills during play. The team even managed to include the tow cable sequence, where the snowspeeder traps the legs of the ATATs, bringing them to the ground. It's impressive stuff. The Millennium Falcon stage also makes use of a cockpit view while taking down TIE fighters and navigating the asteroid field, while Luke's arrival on Bespin has this neat above and under the clouds effect. But despite the technical brilliance of Super Empire, the game itself fares a lot worse than its predecessor. And again, this comes down to the absolutely crushing difficulty, though the game has other issues as well that gives off the feeling that the team simply didn't have the time to fulfill all of their ideas this time. For one, remember how the trash compactor was left out of Super Star Wars? Well, Super Empire Strikes Back also has cut content that one can actually find traces of in the game's manual, namely the asteroid chase stage and an additional stage with Luke in Cloud City. But let's look at Luke's force abilities first. On paper, this is a really neat idea, and it should flesh out the experience of playing as Luke, giving the player the sense of becoming a Jedi Master, but unfortunately the powers are woefully underused throughout the game. In fact, you barely make use of any of them at all throughout the experience, beyond the genuinely helpful heal function, of course. Try as you might, the need to stop, select the Force Power, and then activate the Force Power in a game this unforgiving makes it a gamble to bring up the option at all, and the powers themselves are not always that useful. Mind control, for instance, sounds neat, but with how the game is laid out, there's really never a need to use it. Luke's lightsaber also has a rather big hitbox issue, often not connecting with smaller enemies at awkward angles. The only true innovation here is the ability to block attacks with his sword, which doesn't really come into play until the very last stage, to be honest. The grenades and melee attacks for the other characters face similar issues as well. They're neat, but don't have practical use within the game. It's always a better option just to be uncivilized and use the trusty old blaster. But yes, the difficulty. Your chances of survival in this game are 725 to 1. The boss battles stretch on for way too long. The vast stages and overpowered regular enemies will knock you back time and again. And of course, you still have limited lives and continues. Certain stages, such as this side view snow speeder, is straight out of Mustafar as enemies constantly get behind your ship, which has little to no maneuverability due to its massive size, making sure you simply can't get out of this predicament. At least one thing that makes all of this somewhat more tolerable is the new password system, 
which you're probably going to need. There's also the issue that simply Empire Strikes Back, which is a fantastic film, isn't as visually recognizable as A New Hope. And the constant jumping between scenarios means that the level design often becomes somewhat abstract and deviates too greatly from the film sets. The sound fares similarly, as it lacks the impact of the first title, and the overall arrangement quality seems slightly less crisp, with more reverb than the game before it. All in all, Super Empire Strikes Back is an interesting technical game, but a much lesser title to actually play. Beyond all of this, the game still suffers from the same crushing slowdown that we saw in the original game, and in fact, it's sometimes worse here. All in all though, Super Empire Strikes Back is an interesting technical game to experience, but a much lesser game to actually play. The difficulty is ramped up way too high, the new attacks and force powers are underutilized, and the game doesn't feel as focused and polished as this prior installment. It's also the only true Nintendo exclusive in the series now in modern times. As Luke, Leia, 3PO, and R2 gaze towards the stars as the credits roll by, the promise of Super Return of the Jedi closes out this chapter, and with two games under their belts, there's still hope that, with the culmination of the trilogy, the biggest, greatest adventure is yet to come. But before we leave Empire Strikes Back completely, let's all stand up for the true MVP here, Jeff Krosno. This legend won a chance to appear in the game via Electronic Gaming Monthly, and here he is, immortalized as a rebel commander on Hoth. The Force will be with you always, Krosno. In 1994, Super Return of the Jedi made its promised premiere on the Super NES to cap off the original trilogy on the system and bring peace to the galaxy. With now two successful titles under their belt and over four years of Star Wars development experience, LucasArts and Sculptured Software dials certain aspects of the gameplay back a notch and brings the saga to a more familiar linear format than that of Super Empire. Similar to Super Star Wars, each stage now has a designated roster of characters to choose from, depending on their placement and the story that is, and it allows for the largest selection yet, as Luke, Leia, Chewie, Han Solo, and even Wicket the Ewok are all playable over the course of the game. As before, each character comes with its own set of attributes and skills, from Luke's Jedi mastery to Han's flashy blaster skills to Wicket's acrobatting platforming. While Super Empire saw Luke have a large but generally useless selection of Force powers, in Return of the Jedi his skills have been condensed down to just five, all of which are more directly applicable to the game itself this time around. Things such as healing, invincibility, and the sword throw can all be made use of strategically. The debuting Leia is also the only character in the series to have two distinct playstyles, each patterned after her appearance in the film. During the early phases of the game, she'll don the Boosh costume. Later, however, she will wear the contractually obligated steel bikini on board Jabba's luxury sand cruiser. New to the game are also these more linear Mode 7 race stages, the interesting Mode 7 cannon stage, and the blindingly confusing maze of the Death Star run. The levels themselves have been scaled down in overall size from Super Empire, and there's a greater emphasis on massive screen filling bosses, of which there are plenty. The actual platforming and exploration have also been overhauled and are much more engaging and fun. The game now feels more similar to something like Turrican with its fairly open-ended routes leading to the same end goal with plenty of secrets to discover. The graphical style of the game has also seen a slight overhaul, making more use of actual digitized graphics this time with direct imagery from the film though it can often be contrasted by some rather cartoony looking boss characters or enemies, leading to a slightly uneven feeling in the art direction. Still, the game looks fantastic and the set pieces are the best in the series with the backgrounds, lighting effects, and sheer level of detail very much at the top of its game. But what about the patented Super Star Wars difficulty, you ask? Well, there's good news and bad. 
The good news is that the overall game balance and refined mechanics now mean that the stages themselves are fair and for the most part rather fun. Well, except for these Ewok stages, just forget those exist. There's plenty of extra lives to be found and shield items and the likes are increased in drop rate, as well as these rebel symbol points that give one-ups when you collect a hundred of them. The bad news though, the bosses. These bosses have a bounty on you and they aren't leaving until they get their share. Each stage comes with its own boss, and while their designs, patterns, and gimmicks are much more enjoyable than those seen in Super Empire, Return of the Jedi's bosses are just so relentless that you may as well put down the controller and use the force instead. Still, despite that, Return of the Jedi can best be summed up as a return to form. Super Star Wars introduced the saga to Super NES and gave us a linear yet difficult romp through the movie's key moments, while Super Empire deviated a bit too far and relied too much on underutilized ideas and droning level designs. Super Return of the Jedi, though, brings back the more focused level design of the original, and the core experience has been cleaned up with more focus. Each stage throughout the game offers some rather unique concepts, such as the darkened caves, speeder bike chases, all the way to this AT-AT climb reminiscent of the Sandcrawler in Super Star Wars. Overall, it's a highly enjoyable experience, but the difficult boss battles will take their toll on you, and the game feels like it tries to inch out just a tad too many levels for its own good. And the last few stages inside the Death Star? They're a complete dud. It's a neat idea, but as you can see, it just turns into this confusing, narrow mess that runs at a much lower resolution than the rest of the game. Oh, and just forget about those Ewok stages, seriously. Super Return of the Jedi is strong with the Force then, but by 1994, and with one game per year within the same formula, it can't escape the feeling of simply being a bit played out. And there's hardly any surprises here. And while the visuals have been overhauled significantly in this entry, the series' infamous performance issues remain. Just as in prior games, the frame rate tanks whenever the action heats up, which by 1994 is pretty disappointing. I will say though, it feels a bit smoother than Super Empire does. But one surprise here is that Super Return of the Jedi actually saw release on other platforms, officially for the first time. A trimmed down version of the game was released not only on Nintendo's own Game Boy, but also on the Sega Game Gear. These handheld versions are nearly identical apart from the colorization on the Game Gear and were done by Black Pearl Software. While they are neat, truncated versions of the Super NES original without the technical splendor on display and with severely drawn back animation and effects, the games feel a tad too flat. The bosses are simplified and made easier, however, and most of the side-scrolling stages are here, albeit everything runs at a much lower frame rate. Even still, it's an impressive effort to bring the 16-bit experience to the handhelds, but perhaps not quite the right game to see such a conversion since it so depended on the trickery and magic of the Super NES hardware to all come together. This release, however, marks the end of the Super Star Wars trilogy on Super NES, but it was just the beginning for Star Wars in video games. Super Star Wars Legacy brought the entire saga to a single home console and reignited the spark that had set the world ablaze in the late 70s yet again for a new generation. Alongside these incredibly successful games, Kenner would announce by 94 a brand new action figure line, marking the first time in over 10 years that new Star Wars toys were being manufactured. Additionally, the games themselves would get a rare marketed reprint in 1997, something that was not especially common back then, in conjunction with the re-releases of the original trilogy on VHS for the fabled Special Editions. The games would remain popular long past their original release date, with both developers and fans alike. In 94, after the release of Super Return of the Jedi, Legendary Studio Factor 5 even helmed a similar project for the Super NES in Indiana Jones' Greatest Adventure, a game that owes more or less its entire design and gameplay concepts to the Super Star Wars series. Some of the staff that had worked on Super Star Wars then immediately joined the production that was set to bring Star Wars fully back to the mainstream eye with Shadows of the Empire. There are clear nods to the Super Star Wars series throughout Shadows, especially when you compare them. 
Each of these games share the same basic combination of on-foot sections playing as a character and vehicle-based actions, leading players through an authentic Star Wars experience. The famous Hoth level featured in Shadows of the Empire, and the stage that it's perhaps best known for, is most interesting here, as it surprisingly closely resembles the same sequence featured in Super Empire Strikes Back. You're taking on different groups of enemies before attaching your tow cable to topple the AT-ATs marching across the field. To think that this epic sequence was first achieved back in 1993 on Super NES. And we'd see this battle yet again with Sega's own take on the original trilogy, with Star Wars Trilogy released in the arcade. This game was powered by Sega's own Model 3 arcade board and took the players on a brief journey through key moments of the original trilogy, complete with stunning graphics unlike anything we'd seen from a Star Wars based game before it. With renewed interest in Nintendo's extensive back catalog around the Wii's Virtual Console then, LucasArts also put the original trilogy out on the service starting on August 10th, 2009, bringing the games back yet again for a new generation to enjoy, and even bringing discussions regarding retro game difficulty onto the mainstream outlets. And today, via the wonders of emulation and flashcards, as well as the incredible work from people such as the late legendary programmer Nier, Super Star Wars can be enjoyed with full CD soundtrack playback, similar to how a theoretical Sega CD or PC CD-ROM version of the games might have fared, perfectly bringing the original John Williams score to the original titles. The orchestrations by Paul Webb in the original releases were fantastically done for the Super NES, mind you, but this just sounds perfect, don't you think? <laughs> Perhaps one day, coupled with something like the SA-1 hacks for Gradius 3 and Contra 3, Super Star Wars could be enjoyed on the SNES hardware without any slowdown and orchestrated soundtracks. That's the dream anyways. But with that, we've finally arrived at the end of our journey, and I hope we've provided insight into the early years of Star Wars video games today. Thank you for making it all the way to the end, and thank you for your support, and may the Force be with you always. Hi, Rich. Oh, you. What do you want? Well, you know, we just did that DF Retro on Super Star Wars, and I've been feeling pretty strong with the Force lately, so I figured I would try to Force choke you and take you out, finally! <sighs> Are you done? Yeah. It's just like my wedding night all over again. Good. I guess I still have a lot to learn about the Force, huh, Rich? <laughs> you have failed me for the last time. Oh. Rich! <laughs> <laughs>